our knowledge and experiences. We are privileged today to have such a distinguished researcher as Professor Thorsten Wilson for his work on the neural basis of visual perception to share his knowledge and experience. His research shows how visual information collected by the retina is transmitted to and processed in the, the visual context of the brain. His study opened the door for the understanding and treatment of a childhood cataract and strabismus. I hope he presents and the idea he is sharing with us today will inspire young Cambodians to do research in the future. On behalf of the Ministry of Health, I solemnly declare the public dialogue what a culture of peace entitled Science for Peace is now officially open. I am looking forward to hearing Professor Thorsten Wiesel to share his knowledge and expression with all of us. Thank you. So, I first uh, like to thank you for inviting me to come here, and particularly Director Hom, uh, and for the nice welcome you have given me uh, this, this this morning or this afternoon. And I also like to thank uh, the organizer of this event, uh, uh, Uwe Moritz, uh, for uh, this initiative of bringing uh, distinguished scientists to come uh, here to uh, communicate uh, their knowledge to you. Now, uh, I use this microphone because uh, I wanted to be sure that you could hear me because I tend to move around 
and uh, it's very important that you can hear me. So I wonder if you in the back could raise your hands if you can hear me. Nobody is raising his or her hands in the back. <laughs> okay, so you can hear me clearly. Now, you all have uh, received this uh, booklet. And uh, my speech will be very much uh, a simple speech that I'm going to give here. And very, very, I'm very grateful that the university has printed because some of you may have difficult uh, with the language, particularly when I speak. I tend, my wife says that I tend to mumble. <laughs> so if you. Uh, you can follow in the text uh, as I give it my lecture. Okay? And the I, mean, I just need to find my glasses. <laughs> and I look forward to, uh, I will give this lecture and then as you listen and I'd like to uh, let our dialogue um, be uh, a live, lively, uh, learn about attacks and the madness of suicide bombers, the collapse of the world economy, global warming, and statistics showing that, that over 2 billion people are living on less than $2 a day. Now, from my perspective, uh, having grown up in a large mental hospital where my father was a head psychiatrist. I feel right at home in this crazy world, which we all live. However, trained as a medical doc doctor and a brain scientist, I I cannot, I must ask, what can we do to cure the illness of society? Or, a question, is it too late? So, I decided to make three points in this talk. And the first one, I tried to address in a very simple-minded way, uh, the issue about the peace of mind. And then I'd like to draw examples from scientists and who have received the Peace Prize, Nobel Peace Prize, and therefore played a role as scientists for peace. And last, I will make a few comments about my own involvement, just to give you a reason to understand why I perhaps foolishly agreed to talk about science and peace since I basically is a scientist. I spent 40 years in the laboratory and is not really prepared to, eat, to uh, discuss great issues like science for peace. Now it's difficult to talk about peace without talking about the war. Now, I grew up in Sweden during the 1930s and witnessed the event that led to the Second World War and observed as a young boy, I was, I was born in 1924 and the Second World War began in 1939 when I was 15 years old, but I was very interested early on in what happened in the world. And I noticed the tension between leaders that led up to the war. Now, of particular importance was when I, as a student, listened to Adolf Hitler on the radio, whipping up an entire audience at huge rallies through his skill as a demagogue and orator, and thereby creating mass hysteria 
with the audience screaming, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler. I still remember listening in the radio to, to these uh, kind of speech, speeches and the audience response. Now, this phenomenon of how you can influence large audiences is quite interesting from, from a brain scientist's point of view. Observing how fragile the mind is in that powerful, the powerful character of simple and destructive ideas can easily seduce individual minds and an entire population. We still do not understand, either as people or as scientists, how this occurs and how to protect the individual and the people from being afflicted by this kind of, as I look at it, as an illness. We used uh, crossbreeding in order to generate the uh, plants that were resistant uh, to various, uh, to dry climate, to insects, to various parasites, and, and, um, and selected them those. Uh, now, I had um, the pleasure to meet the Bora at a meeting in China a few years ago, uh, a few years before he died, uh, a couple of three years ago. Uh, and he was the most charming and modest gentleman. And I asked him about uh, what he felt about having used a different approach of crossbreeding, what he thought about genetic manipulations. Because, uh, and, and uh, so he said, oh, of course, this is a logical extension of the work I did, and I welcome it. I raise this point because, uh, as you know, there is a controversy in some countries, and perhaps even here in Cambodia, about the use of genetically modified food, so, so, so called GM food. Uh, and um, from I'm not a, of a culturist, I'm a neuroscientist, but so far as my studies and what I know from talking to people in the field is that there's no real scientific uh, reason for the, the uh, uh, not using genetically, 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 genetically modified food. So policies in some countries against the use of gen genetically modified food seems not to be in the best interest for the farmers in terms of yield per acre, and most importantly, such regulation deprive needy and starving people of food. This, this new technology is truly a great example of how science, when applied constructively and intelligently, can serve to benefit mankind, and therefore, as I said before, also serve for using in science for peace. Now, in the last part of my talk, I will say a few words about my own reason for standing here and talking to you, in a sense. And, uh, you know, as I said before, I've spent four years in the lab and really have it. And talking to a medical audience like this, it would be more natural for me to talk about my scientific work, work than science for peace. But I'm here to talk about science for peace. And I'm very much, uh, as you can see from my last comments here in the presentation, I'm very much uh, involved in the effort to use science as one of the instruments for peace. Now, i just like to mention briefly that my last name is Visa, and there is an, another peace prize winner called Amy Visa. 
and he won his uh, Peace Prize in 1984, I think it was, 